the 12th edition of Z Jaipur Literature Festival. We are here at Darbar Hall and we have got Indian Princess versus the Raj. Can we please welcome our panelists, Moin Mir, Stuart Gordon, Sunil S. Amrit, in conversation with Ira Mukoti. This session is sponsored by Avid Reading. Bigger round of applause, please. Can I begin? Is the, are we, yes? Okay. Good evening, everybody. Um, <clears throat> thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Ira Mukhoti, and I'm here to moderate the session, Indian Princes versus the Raj. So when the, e when the East India Company cobbled together uh, an empire in India through means both foul and fair, uh, they did so uh, through indirect rule a lot of the time, and two-fifths of this enormous land mass nonetheless remained under the control of local princes, some 565 at the time of independence. Uh, now, some of these states were tiny, but some were substantially large, like Mysore, Savankore, Hyderabad, etc. So as their power became systematically undermined by the EIC, the princes sometimes retreated into safer quarters, like Rani Lakshmi Bai's husband, Gangadha Rao of Jhansi, or the Nawab Wajid Ali Shah of Awadh, famously. These men retreated into theater, music, and dance. The British found them effeminate, debauched, and unmanly. Um, but now and after independence, the princes found themselves on the wrong side of the nationalist argument. So in a certain way, the princely states uh, were a reminder of a somewhat shameful past and were relegated to the margins of history. But have the Maharajas been undervalued? Is it time to re-examine the ways in which some of the princely states were nonetheless able to exercise influence and promote perhaps ancient and indigenous ways of being? Were states sometimes able to stand up to the EIC and later the Raj? With us this afternoon to take this discussion further are, to my immediate right, Professor Sunil S. Amrit, who is the Mera Family Professor of South Asian Studies and Professor of History at Harvard University. He is a 2017 MacArthur Fellow, known by the rather awesome sobriquet of the Genius Grant, and, and recipient of the 2016 Infosys Prize in Humanities. His latest book is Unruly Waters, How Monsoons and Mountain Rivers Have Shaped South Asia's History. He is also the author of Crossing the Bay of Bengal, The Furies of Nature and the Fortunes of Migrants, which won the John F. Richards Prize in South Asian History. Next to him is Professor Stuart Gordon. He's an independent scholar long associated with the Center for South Asian Studies, University of Michigan. Dr. Gordon is the author of, sorry, the light is uh, reflecting, the Maratha 1600s to 1818, translated this year into Marathi and several dozen articles on South Asian history. Recent writings include Where Asia Was the World, A History of the World in 16 Shipwrecks and Shackles of Iron, Slavery Beyond the Atlantic and There and Back. He is currently writing a world history textbook for Oxford University Press based on seven themes common to all societies such as gender, channeling food, and slavery. And last is Moen Mir on the extreme right. He's the author of Surat, Fall of a Pot, Rise of a Prince, Defeat of the East India Company in the House of Commons, which traces the annexation of Surat, India's greatest port, by the East India Company and the rise of Mir Jafar Ali Khan, the Prince of, Stu of Surat, who goes on to lead a riveting legal counterattack against the colonizing corporation. Mir's previous work is in the co-authored Mirza Ghalib and the Mirs of Gujarat. He is currently working on his next book set in 18th century Europe and India. So, Professor Amrit, can I call you Sunil? Yes. <laughs> I would like to begin by asking you to set the stage for us and describe the balance of power, um, of the, the balance of British colonial power and therefore the opportunities still available to some of the Indian princely states. Sure. Um, as you've already pointed out, Ira, I, I think we need to remember how internally varied what we think of as, as the British Raj was. I mean, even on that, that quintessential, 
representation of, of sovereignty of the 19th century, the map, I mean, the map of India was pretty blotchy. Yes, there were large uh, stretches of British ruled red, but there were lots of other colors on the map. And these were, of course, a whole variety of princely states. And let's also remember that the princely states varied enormously in size from, from tiny principalities to you know, enormous stretches of India, if you think of Hyderabad, for example. Um, also, at the same time, coexisting with British-ruled India and the princely states were other foreign-ruled enclaves. Think of Pondicherry, think of Goa, and you have a very complicated map. Um, one thing to bear in mind, I think, is the global context. And there's a brilliant history of the global 19th century by the uh, German historian uh, Jürgen Osterhammel. He points out that in the sort of 1860s, 1870s, is probably the high point of variety in the types of states that existed in the world. Um, you know, in, in a sense, in the 20th century, you see the, uh, the, the narrowings to, to the point where the nation state is the only state form, pretty much, uh, that we, we have by the middle of the 20th century. But in the middle of the 19th century, India was no exception. There were all sorts of, of, of principalities and different kinds of states coexisting with very large empires. So I think we should also put India in the context of, say, the princely states of, of Southeast Asia, of which there were many still independent by the 1860s. You know, not until the 1880s did the Europeans really complete the conquest of Southeast Asia. When I was a, a graduate student, I did my work in the early 2000s, there would have been very few of my fellow students who worked on the princely states. I mean, for, partly for reasons I think you've already mentioned, it was seen as perhaps an unfashionable thing to work on, and people were interested in the history of nationalism and intellectual history and gender history and social history. Um, and, and yes, I think perhaps the princely states were seen as somehow anachronistic. But I think new work um, and I'm, I'm delighted that, that Stuart and Moyne are going to both talk about the work that they've done, makes us think again about the princely states. And I think it makes us think about the princely states in, in different ways. Uh, one is the fact that, you know, there was a very influential book written by Nicholas Dirks in the 1980s about the state of Pudukote called The Hollow Crown. And that was the consensus at the time, that the princely sovereignty was a fig leaf, that, that any sovereignty that princely states seemed to have left was, was simply a mask and that they were really under complete British domination. I think some work has shown that while the extent of British domination was clearly very real, very significant, that princely states took their own sovereignty seriously, that they turned to international law, that they turned to the courts, that they turned to global connections that they had to defend that sovereignty, to make clear that they thought of themselves as princely states within a wider world, and, and many of them were very ambitious, I think, along these lines. Um, the other reason I think we should think again about the princely states is that maybe the story isn't just princely states versus the Raj. One of the things that struck me in, in the work that I've done is many of these princely states were very cosmopolitan places. They had deep connections with other parts of Asia, with other parts of the world. You think of the princely states in the southwest of India, deeply connected with the Indian Ocean commerce, with the Indian Ocean migration. Uh, similarly, princely state like Hyderabad, right through the 19th century, maintained its links with Persia, with the Middle East, with, with Central Asia. So I think maybe if we think of the princely states in terms of, of a broader struggle for, for modernity in the 19th century, uh, we, we start to see them differently. Really interesting, a complete redefinition perhaps of what the idea of control means as well. And Stuart, can I ask you to take that thought forward in examining uh, Bhopal and Rampur in the context of the Unani medicine, the Ayurveda medicine that they were able to support? Uh, let me do something first. Put up your hand if you know what there is a, a system called Unani medicine. Ah, great. I've done this for people for one or two hands have gone up. It's a, a system that goes back to Greek medicine. Um, it claims that, it may or may not. Uh, strong in Persia and much migration of those doctors uh, as Persia somewhat declined in the, in the early period of uh, uh, Delhi Sultanates. Many doctors came to India from Persia and Central Asia. That said, there was an enormous amount of uh, between doctors in the Ayurvedic system and doctors in Unani, there's a tremendous amount of interchange. Uh, and I want to emphasize that it's not only one system, but there is a merger of the two. Uh, Ayurvedic texts were translated into Persian. Persian texts were translated uh, into Sanskrit. Uh, 
So this was a, a, a very viable, going concern all through the Mughal Empire and into the first half of the 19th century. In a nutshell, what happened was the British asserted their rights uh, or the, the right path to be only allopathic medicine. They outlawed, hounded, demonized Yunani medicine practitioners. Some fled to various towns where the British were not so strong. Many of them fled to states which subsequently became princely states. In fact, Yunani probably would have died completely had it not be, been for princely state patronage. Let me give you the examples of how that happened. Um, first, in the, the Begums of Bhopal, which you probably know about, were the de facto and de jure rulers of the small state of du Bhopal. Part of their um, support for Yunani medicine was establishing teaching colleges, which in fact had a far higher number of women doctors trained in them than anywhere else in India at that point. Hyderabad did the same thing. They established the full, first full Yunani hospital and also training facilities. Now, what was going on here? This is a little speculative. I've been looking at it. The support for Yunani was seen as a very subtle form of resistance against British rule. There are times that it became a whole lot less subtle as British residents tried to persuade the princes or the Begums to tromp down on Yunani as not modern, not useful, not proven. And I think we really have to reconsider other things that the rulers did which were subtle forms of resistance and Yunani, Yunani was one of them. Correct, and I think the princes uh, may have had a more organically connected uh, links to their lands and, and better knowledge of you know, uh, how to use that, uh, the, the resources that they controlled. Uh, Sunil, you, your latest book does uh, exactly that, deals with the water resources in Mysore and how the local rulers were able to use that. Can you tell us a little bit more? Sure, well if we think about the single most serious and longest running water dispute in India since independence, it's probably the Kaveri dispute between Tamil Nadu and Karnataka. And that, of course, originates in a conflict over sovereignty between the princely state of Mysore and the British Raj and the Madras presidency. And the reason the conflict arose in the first place is that the, the rulers of Mysore were actually quite ambitious by the end of the 19th century in what they wanted to do with that water. And the first hydroelectric dam in India was not built in British India, it was built in, in Mysore. It was built to fuel the Kolar gold mines. And, and, and this is the origin of the conflict over the use of the Kaveri waters and the uh, responsibility of upstream and downstream users uh, to, to manage that river. And there were a series of court cases that went uh, through to the 1920s. And in fact, that 1924 ruling is still invoked as both Tamil Nadu and Karnataka continue to go through the courts in India to try to press their claims to more Kaveri water. Uh, and what sparked this was in fact the, the modernizing ambitions of, of Mysore. And where that really came to fruition was that Mysore hired somebody who was by that time already one of India's most skilled water engineers, and that was um, the, the very renowned hydraulic engineer Visveshwaraya who became a national hero after independence in India, but he worked for the British colonial government of Bombay for 20, 30 years. But in a sense, he reached a glass ceiling. Uh, because he was Indian, he could never have become chief engineer of Bombay. So in a sense, the Mysore government lured him away and said, come and be chief engineer of Mysore. And eventually, he became the Dewan of Mysore in the 1910s and, and enacted educational reforms, uh, but also built what was one of India's biggest dams at that time. And it was only because the British subsequently wanted to build the Metur Dam uh, further down the Kaveri that, that that particular dispute over the water uh, arose. And so, in fact, Mysore gave someone like Vishveshwaraya a terrain 
and a degree of freedom and, and also the resources to do more with water engineering than most other parts of British India were doing at the time. So in many ways, one can see the lineage of India's obsession with large dams, which of course has had negative as, as, uh, effects as well as uh, positive ones um, at the time to the sort of princely states and some of their innovations and particularly the case of Mysore. Well, that's really interesting and uh, something we think about only too little, I think. Uh, Professor Stu um, Stuart, can we take this forward and think about the uh, the women, some of the women in the princely states. I mean, we know that sometimes when the men crumbled, when the princes crumbled, the women stepped up to this. So, for example, Hazrat Mahal in Awad, you know, when Wajid Ali Shah uh, retreated into poetry and such like, she stepped in. So, were women sometimes more resilient to this hyper-masculine uh, colonialism of the British? Is there something we can say about that? Well, the, what became princely states, of course, were small polities before, some much larger than that. Uh, and there are examples where the coming of a princely state did or did not decrease the power of women. Let's take, for example, the, the case of Ahilyabai Holkar, which is probably as well known as any. Uh, and how did she end up in what was subsequently a British state, uh, princely state, how did she end up in the line of succession at all? Well, she was, again, when we think of states run by women, there is a, there is a, a play between the women and the, and the relevant men. In this case, her father groomed her for 15 years before she became ruler of Holker State. She was buying, casting, overseeing mo movement of canon for 15 years before she became, and it was clear that she was the most competent person. Um, in other situations, for example, in Bhopal, uh, Bhopal is much later even than Holkar. It really only dates from about 1795, but it's clear, was clear to the army that the most competent ruler was the woman was the Begum, was not the relevant male. Now, this raises a whole series of questions about our assumptions, especially in small states, of man-to-man-to-man-to-man -to -man -to -man -to -man rule when the only way to make sure that you had a reign was to have the army behind you. And clearly the Begums of Bhopal were not isolated in some sort of harem they were in fact actively negotiating with the armed forces that they controlled as well as the Maratha government who they had to make sure were, were okay with all of this and that their taxes were paid. So exceptional women could work to the top of a small state just as much as they could with a large. Moen, your story details, I think, the only time that a prince was successful in defeating um, the EIC on their home turf and in parliament. Uh, and yet the story is really largely forgotten. And uh, what we have forgotten also is the history of an amazing city and port, Surat. Um, uh, so tell us a little bit, I think you have a presentation to take us through your work and some of your findings. Tell us a little bit first about that. Um, thank you, Ira. Um, and thank you, JLF, for this opportunity to be here. Um, yes, my book is primarily about Surat, which, uh, which was a principality, and not very many people know that Surat actually had a Nawab ship, uh, probably one of the most powerful Nawab ships uh, of, of India. Um, it's a story that was lost in time because uh, the destruction of Surat by the English East India Company um, was done primarily to build Bombay. Uh, subsequent to, uh, to, to strangling maritime trade at Surat and building maritime trade in Bombay, um, you know, they went on to usurp the private estates of the Nawab. And I found that, um, you know, a, a really interesting story to tell about how this man uh, goes on to challenge them, not just you know, in India, but also in, um, in their own parliament overseas in Victorian England. 
and so that was the reason why I, I wrote the book, and I, I thought it was absolutely a, a compelling story. Um, but um, uh, you know, uh, just coming back to the to the topic, yeah, Indian princes versus the Raj, there is this glazed kind of a, um, uh, you know um, uh, an image of Indian princes of being utterly pampered. Uh, of, of people running these exotic harems, uh, opium addicts, all of that. Um, but, you know, um, uh, if you look at history quite broadly, um, from 1757, which is when the East India Company actually defeated Nawab Siraj ad of Bengal, from 1757 right up till 1857, the Indian princes who were actually just, you know, fragmented after the Mughal Empire collapsed, resisted and resisted the English, the Marathas, the Sikhs, the Anglo-Sikh wars, the Anglo-Maratha wars bear testimony to this incredible resistance to the British. Uh, Tipu Sultan, I know he's, a, he's got a checkered character, but, you know, he resisted the English, and that is, that is without doubt, the Nawabs of Surat, etc. So to say that the English, uh, uh, you know, the British pampered the Indian princes, uh, is something which actually does happen, but it happens much later. Between 1757 and 1857, there's nothing but resistance. Um, and then towards the end of 1800, the early 1900s, oddly enough, you know, uh, uh, there's a pampering of Indian princes, if you wish. But still, there are great examples of Indian princes resisting British political agents uh, interfering in their states. For example, uh, the Maharaja of Baroda, the Gaikwad, you know, his struggle against the continual political uh, uh, interference in his state is almost legendary, so much so that he turned his back on, in the 1911 Darbar on the, on, the, uh, on the emperor and walks away. Um, so that's what I wanted to say about Absolutely, the general to yes. topic. Um, but I do have some slides, and if the lady can bring up the slide presentation, it will be great. Ah, there it is. Okay, so my book, um, which is Surat, Fall of a Port, Rise of a Prince, is basically um, the story of Surat, as I mentioned. Uh, you know, Surat was India's most eclectic city. Today we talk about New York, we talk about Shanghai, we talk about all these incredible cities, London, all of them. But think about it, that Leo Tolstoy wrote about Surat's cafes and said that they were the most, you know, they, they could be compared to the cafes in, in Venice. Um, and Surat attracted, like a magnet, um, merchants from all parts of the world. Uh, a really interesting and cosmopolitan city. You had Armenians, you had uh, uh, Chalabi Turks, you had Jews, uh, obviously the local Hindu and Jain population, the Muslims, the Bora Muslims, all knitted together trading in this absolutely, uh, um, you know, incredible port city. Um, it got the title of bab -e mecca which basically means the doorway to Mecca because Muslims would leave the shores of Surat to go to Mecca for their pilgrimage. It, ha it was, the, the landscape of Surat was, um, you know, dotted with Sufi shrines, with, um, you know, with, with, uh, with fantastic Portuguese churches. Um, and so it was this, this, this city that had come to almost sim symbolize India's might uh, in maritime trade. I was uh, at a talk a little early on and Sven Beckett called it the Amsterdam of India. Exactly, you know, that's what it was. So, um, next slide please. Um, and so right at the edge of the river Tapti stood this castle which became the symbol of India's maritime trade. Um, you know, you could, you know, if you, if you have fertile imagination, you can imagine these exotic ships coming from Persia and all of these incredible places um, and, and, and Surat becoming this magnet of sorts. Um, next slide. Um, and so this eclectic mix of Arabs, Jews, uh, Muslims, Hindus, Christians trading together obviously brought about, um, you know, uh, not just uh, a bit of conflict, but a certain sense of pride as well in being Surti, um, you know, and, and uh, it gave rise to a fantastic mix of um, cuisines. You know, today we talk about Bombay being this city with incredible restaurants. 
you know, imagine Surat having Armenian restaurants, Surat having, uh, you know, uh, Baghdadi restaurants, Surat having Portuguese restaurants. That's what Surat was. Next slide. And so the English East India Company actually first landed or docked their ships um, in Surat. Uh, this was um, after they had defeated the Portuguese off Surat and had kind, kind of taken control um, of, uh, of, of you know, European trade uh, in the Arabian Sea. So the Dutch and the English started you know, with very humble beginnings in India. This is uh, a, a, an image of the Dutch and the English factory, which is not too far away, where they uh, were refining cotton as mere uh, you know, factors for the demand that was uh, in, um, in, in, in the Far East. Next slide. But the English particularly made Surat their home. And if you haven't been to Surat, I urge you to go there and visit these fabulous cemeteries. They're, in, they're, in, um, they're iconic buildings because they're a beautiful mix of uh, uh, Indo, Saracenic, and European architecture. Unfortunately, because of lack of will, uh, you know, they're crumbling. But go and see them. This is where the English buried their dead. Uh, the presidents of their companies lie buried there. Um, and, you know, some of their, 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 their finest architects lie buried there. And so Surat, uh, symbolized to, to the English traders, not just uh, you know, as, a, as a trading port, but also their home. Next slide. Um, but Surat was, were ruled by um, these fabulous Nawabs. Uh, they declared independence. The first uh, to declare independence was Teg Bakhan in 1733. Um, and they were magnificent. They were great patrons of art, literature, poetry. They built fabulous buildings encouraged trade, um, you know, they would, there were letters by uh, the Nawabs urging the Armenians to come and trade, uh, you know, writing to the Chalabi Turks to come and, you know, make Surat their home uh, and making Surat this really vibrant cosmopolitan hub. Um, but as uh, the Mughal Empire declined, the rise of the English East India Company happened on the back, um, you know, uh, 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 well, basically, uh, you know, taking over many principalities. Um, but I won't get into how the East India Company spread their tentacles across India. I'll just keep it to Surat. Uh, by 1800, uh, this gentleman, who is Nawab Nasiruddin, um, uh, realized that uh, one man had landed in India with the attitude of changing the narrative of the English East India Company from being mere traders to, um, to colonizers and rulers. And that man, next slide, was uh, Richard Wellesley, the older brother of Arthur Wellesley, who would go on to become the Duke of Wellington. Now, Richard Wellesley came into India as Governor General in 1799, uh, uh, you know, with the attitude of conquering. Uh, he locked horns with many um, directors back in London and told them that, listen, We've lost the Americas. Um, we've lost, uh, 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 you know, this large revenue generating, um, uh, you know, colony, and we need to make India uh, the plains of empire expansion. Uh, immediately, he, he, you know, parks himself in Mysore, wages war against Tipu, defeats him, wages war against the Marathas, and it's all about conquest at all cost. And that inevitably, brings him in head-to-head -head confrontation with Nawab Nasiruddin. Next slide. Um, it's important to understand the nature of Nawab Nasiruddin's powers at this time. Nawab Nasiruddin doesn't have an army of sorts. He has police, he has corps uh, that patrol the city to maintain law and order. Uh, and he has a, you know, a fledgling kind of Mughal navy, which really isn't anything in comparison to Richard Wellesley's naval might. Um, so Richard Wellesley armed twists Nawab Nasiruddin, and under the threat of forceful invasion of Surat, which would mean the demise of all maritime trade, he forces the Nawab to sign away his ruling powers. And, uh, you know, rather reluctantly, but with, with great sorrow and helplessness, Nasiruddin signs the treaty. Next slide. The treaty is very simple. Um, 
The Nawab is allowed to keep his personal estates. They're exceptionally large. Uh, he's promised an annual pension of 10,000 pounds plus 5,000 of the city's revenue, so a total of 15,000 pounds. And the treaty is, uh, you know, is studded with words like, this will last for generation to generation, it will go on for perpetuity, it will go on forever. And knowing that uh, he's, he has secured his family and he has ensured that there is no um, uh, forceful invasion of Surat, Nawab Nasiruddin signs the treaty. Um, next slide. But as time passes, Nasiruddin dies and he's succeeded by his son, Afzaluddin. Now, as we can see from Afzaluddin's uh, arched eyebrows and drooping eyelids, he's a man given to leisure and pleasure. He's famed for his opium dens. He's famed for his harems. Uh, he knows that he doesn't have the administrative uh, responsibilities of ruling Surat because Richard Wellesley has taken them from his father. And so he devotes his entire life to managing his personal estates. The personal estates are, are massive. They, they're close to a dozen palaces, um, extraordinary amount of orchards, gardens. And when you think of Surat today, you know, you can't really think, uh, imagine Surat being this, this city with, you know, gardens as vast as Hyde Park. Um, and so he gives himself up to a, a life of leisure and pleasure. However, there is a lurking fear in Afzaluddin's um, mind. And that fear stems from the fact that he doesn't have a son. He only has one daughter and she's relatively ill. Um, and so begins Afzaluddin's quest to find a male heir whom he can adopt, officially adopt, and make him his successor. So Afzaluddin, uh, you know, sends a, a, a proposal to the Mughal, the decadent Mughal court and the Mughal emperor dispatches his two princes to the Surat court. And, you know, Afzaluddin is overjoyed to see these great Mughal princes entering his palace who would probably be chosen, one of them would be chosen to marry his daughter. Least knowing that within the next couple of days, one of the princes is found in a brothel and the other one is found in Afzaluddin's own opium den, completely, uh, you know, uh, addicted to opium. Um, Anyways, he sends, these, he sends these princes packing because he sees his own reflections in these princes and he realizes that there isn't a man strong enough to stand by his daughter and, um, you know, become the custodian of the house of Surat. Next slide. It's important at this stage just to understand the, the, the estates of, of Surat. They basically were four palaces, absolutely astonishing. You know, we unfortunately do not have pictures or, or, or sketches of these uh, wonderful buildings. They're only in, in, in words when you research in the British Library that you read about them. Um, the Aina Mahal, for example, the Palace of Mirrors, is written about as a palace of a thousand mirrors. Um, you know, the Darya Mahal was a palace on the banks of the river Tapti that shimmered with, with uh, you know, uh, uh, with candles every evening. Next slide. The gardens were astonishing. Um, Nagina Bagh, for example, uh, is written about as a, as a garden that uh, had a huge lagoon um, with lotus, uh, you know, lotus lagoons. Uh, the Dilfiza Bagh was, a, was an orchard which, which was for acres and acres of, uh, of pomegranate trees. Now, these estates were not just the personal property of the Nawab, but they also provided employment employment to gardeners, employment to weavers, to potters, to craftsmen, and it, they were self-sustaining estates. Um, so the search, uh, you know, of, of the opium-addicted Nawab Afzaluddin continues to try and find this, uh, this young man who would, who would uh, help him be the custodian of the house of Surat. Eventually, he decides on the ruler of a really small principality, as was the case in those days where a large princely state would marry into a smaller one. He chooses uh, a small state, next slide, which is called Kamandia. And Kamandia is a small state which is in Katiawar, which is in Gujarat. And Katiawar had the largest number of princely states in India. 222 of the 565 states were in Katiawar itself. But the young man who he chooses is a 17-year-old man called Mir Jafar Ali Khan. 
He's grown up in these wild terrains, fighting bandits. It's the outlawed, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the bad west of India, basically. Um, you know, uh, tribes from Balochistan have descended into Kathiawar, you know, pillaging villages and pillaging estates. And this young man has created quite a name for himself because he's fought, fought off these, these, these ruffians. And word reaches of Zaluddin of this dynamic young prince, and he sends a proposal. The proposal is accepted. Next slide. And this young man, Mir Jafar Ali Khan, becomes the custodian of the house of Surat. He's officially adopted by Afzaluddin, uh, and the official document of adoption is, is exchanged between Afzaluddin and this gentleman's father. But not just that, he gets him married to his daughter. So the strategy is quite clear. If the East India Company do not recognize my daughter, they will have to recognize my adopted son. If they don't recognize the adopted son, they'll have to recognize the daughter. And Afzaluddin thinks that he's secured Surat and he flings himself again into a life of luxury and, and, and all kinds of pleasures. Um, but Afzaluddin, uh, next slide please, dies in 1842. Now the minute Afzaluddin dies, the English East India Company tear up the treaty. Um, and the first thing that they do is they call for an extinction of the title of Nawab of Surat, which by the way is extinct even till today. So the title is abolished, it's made extinct. Uh, there will be no more Nawab of Surat. But worse, what follows next is absolutely uh, despicable. They send out raiding parties into each and every garden, palace and estate and unlawfully lock up these estates which leaves um, the young uh, custodian uh, of the house of Surat and his wife um, you know, virtually on the brink of destitution because not only do they take up the estates, they stop the pension of 15,000 pounds through which they were managing the estates. Now, as fate would have it, the young couple does not have a son again and they just have two daughters. So you can imagine what that young family is going through. They're confined to servant quarters. It is just uh, um, uh, Bakhtiyar Nisa, who was Afzaluddin's daughter, Mir Jafar Ali Khan, who was uh, the adopted son and the husband, and two little girls, infant girls. You know, one is four years and the other one is two. And they're made to, and they're made to leave, lead a life um, of abject poverty for the next few months. Next slide. Um, next slide. Well, next slide. <laughs> now, it is under these circumstances that this particular prince decides to challenge the English East India Company. The East India Company at this time is the most fearful canon of empire expansion. They've basically taken over India. They are the representatives of empire. The East India Company has astonishingly powerful stakeholders and shareholders, which includes lords, dukes, earls, all of them. And they control the destiny of 200 million Indians sitting in London. Now, it's under these circumstances that Mir Jafar Ali Khan does something quite extraordinary. He doesn't just confront them in India, but he voyages to Britain. And in 1844, he lands up and takes up residence, next slide, at a rather posh hotel called the Claridge's. So where does he get the money to do this? His father is, uh, is a reasonably cash-rich ruler of Kamandia, which was the principality that he, was, uh, that he would actually inherit. And he pumps in that money. So he, he takes up the residence at Claridge's Hotel and he starts generating a fair amount of interest. Uh, you know, the English see this man in, in these incredible mogul robes and turbans and um, they're quite taken in by this exotic man. At this time, he's only 26 years old and he creates a bit of a stir in the English press and he starts telling the English people about what the uh, company is all about and what they've been doing. And what is really interesting is that he gets a really uh, you know, strong hearing. The English are quite interested in knowing about what the colonizing corporation has been up to. And he also realizes that the British are not, uh, you know, the East India Company is not beyond criticism. There are a large number of British MPs who are against the East India Company. Next slide. 
And so finally, he has a meeting with the chairman of the East India Company, who reads the works of two English historians. English historians, um, uh, Henry Breveridge and uh, Sir Penrill Moon, condemn the East India Company's tyrannical annexation of Surat. And they actually you know, write about how um, flagrant uh, injustice has been in Surat. But the East India Company refuses to take uh, notice of those, um, you know, those writings, and they do not give Mir Jafar Ali Khan a fair hearing. By this time, he's running out of money because he can't necessarily you know, stay on in England for a long enough time. Next slide. And while he's running out of money, uh, he has one last hope, which is to visit the Royal Ascot um, with one British MP who manages to get him a box which is close to the box of another powerful couple. Next slide. And that couple is Victoria and Albert. Now, Victoria by this time has developed a real interest in India. She's never been to India, but she's heard about this exotic land. She's heard about all of these you know, fascinating stories of India. And uh, it's really fascinating when you read Mun Munshi Lutfullah's uh, documented um, um, uh, chapter on uh, Mir Jafar Ali Khan's visit to the Ascot races. Uh, you can imagine there's this 26-year-old Indian prince dressed in these fine robes. The Times has been talking about his sharp features and good looks, and Victoria just freezes. She freezes her gaze on him, and she asks for an introduction. And during the break in the races, she gets introduced to Mir Jafar Ali Khan, and she asks him why he's here. Actually, Albert asks him why he's here. And very crisply, through his translators, he tells them uh, you know, about the injustices of the East India Company. She and Albert are utterly moved. And what they do next actually changes the course of history as far as this man and his legal campaign would be concerned. Next slide. Um, Victoria and Albert introduce Mir Jafar Ali Khan to two incredibly powerful lawmakers in Britain. And I think this is so important to understand that even at the height of empire, the East India Company could be targeted by fair um, rule of law. Um, and there were opportunities for Indians to go there and tap into the, um, the independent judiciary of Britain. This gentleman is Sir Richard Bethel. He's a Solicitor General to Victoria. Next slide. And the next one is Sir Fitzroy Kelly, who had held the position of Solicitor General to Victoria. And both these gentlemen here, uh, Mir Jafar Ali Khan's case, they are utterly moved and they urge him to stay in Britain and fight. But he has no money, he's running out of cash. And so he has to return rather reluctantly to India. Next slide. Uh, the minute he comes back to India, the East India Company realize that he's come back empty-handed and they can do anything they wish because he's come back with nothing to show. And so they pass a legislation in Bombay which is an unlawful legislation which reads that their decision on Surat and the estates of Surat is final and they can never be prosecuted in India. That leaves him with no alternative in India. There will be no justice for him. Next slide. Um, and at this time his wife dies of tuberculosis. So he's, he's left as the only um, adopted son of Surat and the father of two daughters who are by now, you know, six and eight. Um, next slide. So for the next nine years, he leads this really incredible life of a vagabond Darvesh-like prince. He becomes a mystic. He loses himself in the forests of Katiawar, where his uh, paternal principality of Kamandeya was. It's a small principality, but very fertile. But, you know, he just loses himself to Sufis. And he finds solace in just wandering these arid lands. Astutely, though, keeping in touch with the two powerful lawmakers that Victoria and Albert had introduced him to. Finally, there's an internal calling. And he mortgages everything that he has paternally. All the lands that he has in Kamandeya are put on mortgage. He raises the cash. Next slide. Um, and he returns to England. Next slide. And this time, he comes with a real fire in his belly to choose um, you know, this, 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 this final showdown with the East India Company in their courts of law.
Um, next slide. Once again, he takes up a relatively um, interesting residence. Next slide. It's at 15 uh, Warwick Avenue. And once again, his, his um, you know, uh, arrival in England signals um, you know, this kind of a, a, a euphoria of sorts of getting to know this Indian who's come back again to challenge uh, the East India Company. Next slide. But it's not just um, you know, um, uh, fighting the case because his two lawyers tell him, listen, you'll have to wait for six months because where we want you to go is not the courts of law in Britain, but we want you to go uh, even higher and we want you to go to parliament. But this would take time. It would take six months of documentation work and you will need to wait till we get your documents ready. Six months are spent um, basically, uh, you know, visiting the sights and sounds of London, particularly this particular theatre called Astley Theatre in London, where he finds this astonishingly beautiful lady called Mary Jane Flood, blonde haired, blue eyed, and the Indian prince loses his heart to her. Now, you can imagine the, the Times in London and all the other press going absolutely crazy, writing articles and devoting columns to this cross-pollinated romance that starts blossoming. Next slide. Lord Byron's Maida Vale takes a completely exotic turn because this romance flourishes in Maida Vale uh, along Little Venice. Uh, and, and there's so much to write about. Next slide. Um, he hires a light blue carriage and, and, you know, he goes to operas with Mary Jane Flood and the press can't get enough of him. But deep down he knows what he's come for and finally um, he gets the sanction from the uh, Privy Council to take his case, next slide, into what he would call the final frontier. Um, and I'd, li I'd like you to just picture this. Um, in the next few days, basically it's 1856, the empire is at its peak. Unquestionable power rests in the hands of the English East India Company. They're representatives of empire. And in uh, the House of Commons, an Indian would walk in to challenge them. Never had it been done before. Indian Maharajas and Nawabs had sent agents to meekly you know, press their claims with no, with no, um, uh, you know, no favorable results. So imagine an Indian dressed in, you know, in his robes entering British Parliament as a special case would be made by Richard Bethel to challenge the machinations of empire. Next slide. But the East India Company realized that all of this is happening and by this time they start panicking. And so they appoint two um, uh, MPs to fight his uh, fight the Indian in Parliament. Sir Vernon Smith, who's the president of the East India Company, and Sir James Weir Hogg, both MPs, would do everything to defeat the bill. Next slide. Next slide. So, on the 3rd of June, the representatives of the Indian Prince get up and make their passionate speeches, um, uh, and they urge the House of Commons to vote in favor of an Indian. The speaker refuses to let the vote happen. Next slide. Again on 11th of June, the speaker refuses to let the vote happen. Next slide. And so on and so forth. Finally, a final date is given for the 23rd of June. And Mir Jafar Ali Khan um, is so ravaged by injustice that he calls for the end of British rule in uh, the House of Commons. Uh, and finally, on the 23rd of June, uh, next slide, um, the Speaker is compelled to take the vote uh, into the House of Commons because the tide is rising uh, for the Indian Prince. And uh, what follows next in my mind is, is an iconic day in Indian British history. As far as I'm concerned, I haven't actually uh, been able to get my hands on any information or document that records the House of Commons actually voting in favor of an Indian at the peak of empire. Next slide. Uh, out of a house of 241 MPs, 213 are compelled to vote in favor of an Indian and against the machinations of their own empire. It's the only time that an Indian defeats the East India Company in their own houses of parliament. So that's the story. Wow. But what happens to Mary Jane Flood and Mir Jafar Ali Khan? For that, you'll have to buy the book and read it.
I would fully watch a movie adaptation of that. You know, it's got everything in it, right? British treachery, wonderful Indian tenacity. I think we've run out of time here, so I'm going to open the session out to questions. Uh, for those who have questions in the audience, for the gentleman here, please. Yes, here in the front. Why princes never thought of marriage alliances with the Raj authorities? Why the princes never thought of marriage alliances with the Raj? Yes. See, in the Brit uh, Mughal Empire, there were matrimonial alliances with uh, other princes of India, whereas you know, the British never thought, or who was reluctant? More British, I mean the Raj authorities or uh, you know, the princes? Marriage alliances between the Raj authorities, maybe say Viceroy's daughter or you know, Governor General's daughter or well, some high function. Why such marriage alliances did not take place? They did not right. believe in equality. Any or idea why that didn't happen? Did you look uh, into uh, this aspect? You know, I, uh, I'm uh, unaware of um, any marriage that took place between the British royal family and any royal families in India. I, I think you're quite right. Nothing really happened there. But I, I do believe that there were instances of marriages between the Indian princes and uh, you know, dukes or, or large landholding families in Europe. I don't know the exact uh, exact names, but you know, I, I I would suspect it could also come down to um, you know the, the the in the 1800s until the fishing fleet came out. You know, there was a certain sense of superiority complex that the that the British had, and you know, we can't run from that. It was the truth. Um, uh, you know. Uh, uh, that's what I would, I would reckon. Anyone else? The lady in the front here? So mainly you've been talking about the different types of princes and how they went to court and how they timidly sent agents to oppose the Brits. And up until the revolt of 1857, the only way that at least how I've heard in this presentation you've described that the, uh, that the Indian princes used to only use legal connections and international connections to oppose the British, was there any other way they did other than the subtle, uh, you know, subtly opposing them legally? Sorry, you're echoing. Uh, yeah, I can't, can't, can't hear you, sorry. Very well up here. What I'm asking is that was there a way that the Indian princes opposed the British, which was unrelated to legal efforts well, or international efforts. law? Uh, Oh, many ways. You know, the the 1857 mutiny uh, is, uh, you know, is like before 1857. Yeah, before, before as well. So in 1757, the Nawab of Bengal, Siraj ad dawla fights against, uh, you know, Clive of Plassey. Um, you know, Tipu Sultan. You know, he resisted the British. Rani of Jhansi. You know, she resisted the British. So th they were the the Sikhs, the Anglo Sikh wars, the Anglo Maratha wars. The Peshwa resisted the British. So. What didn't happen till 1857 was a united front. That never really came about, unfortunately. Anyone else? I think maybe a last question. Back yeah, lady back one behind. question which uh, you could answer, that if in 1857 the sovereignty would not have gone to the British crown, and if how things had existed between 1757 to 1857, that itself had existed further, a oh, hypothetical question, what would have been the situation if East India Company would have kept on doing what they wanted and sovereignty not transferred to the crown in 1857? Yeah, so the question is what would have happened if… If, uh, how things were between 1757 to 1857, if that yeah. had continued, yeah. there would not have been a transfer of sovereignty to the British crown, if the company had come, what would have happened according to you? Yeah. Well, I, I, I think, um, you know, it's, it's very speculative. I think there would have been uh, a, a very strong rising Maratha power. And I think the, uh, the defeat of the Marathas, you know, at least in my opinion, was, the, was in many ways the beginning of the end of any kind of Indian resistance. So if it would not have been uh, for the English East India Company, I would put my bets on the Marathas for, for you know, replacing the Mughal Empire and probably just having the Mughal as a, as a nominal head. Uh, but in my opinion, the, the demise of the, the, the Marathas was 
basically the end of any kind of Indian resistance. But also like the other gentlemen have been saying, there were different forms of resistance, yeah. you know, indigenous traditions, local culture, this is resistance of a sort as well. We don't only have to look at battlefields and, you know, there, there are different ways to look sure. at resistance, right, as all of you have shown. Anyone else? Yes, uh, the lady there in the middle, please. Sir, could you please talk about the sources of this information? What is the nature of evidence that is available? For whom, uh, who are you addressing the question to? Me here. Ah. The what of it was really interesting. Thank you for sharing. But I'm interested in knowing the how of it. Sure. Okay. Um, the bulk of my information came from, uh, well, the parliamentary affairs, the debates in the House of Commons comes from um, uh, Hansard, which is the British Hansard, which is the British official documentation of all the minutes of the proceedings in the House of Commons. Also, the official document of the minutes of the House of Commons uh, proceedings of 1856 is, um, you know, uh, is something which you can get access to in libraries. Uh, the India uh, office records in the British Library at King's Cross proved to be an exceptional um, you know, place to, to, to find information. Um, and then, of course, the Asiatic Library in Bombay um, has some incredible records. The Bombay Gazetteers. Um, the Gujarat, uh, you know, there's an incredible book called The History of Gujarat by Commissarat. Um, you know, that proved to be uh, exceptionally vital. All the letters in terms of correspondence that was exchanged between Mir Jafar Ali Khan and the English East India Company are in the IOR, the Indian Office Records in the, uh, uh, in the, in the archives. Yeah, yes, please, of course. Sure. Um, I just wanted to point out that the business of going after each other uh, in a legal court rather than on the battlefield was an extremely common process under the Marathas. Some of those cases, which I've looked at a few of them, went on for generations, uh, sometimes winning, sometimes losing, sometimes gaining a little more land, sometimes not, sometimes being treated as disloyal and all the land taken away. But the the, and the pumping of resources into a court case using the best uh, knowledge, the best speakers, the best references. Uh, and it seems like incredibly ironic that the entire Peshwa Dufter, much of which is these legal court cases, was saved, by being, saved from being sold as waste paper because some of these court cases were carrying right on into the British rule. So we have that strange background that saved what are the most important primary documents of the Peshwa period. I'd just like to say one thing um, very briefly. Um, you know, um, while I was writing the book, um, and I am scathing of the East India Company in the book, you know, the, the fact that the British judiciary is so powerful, the British judiciary was so independent, the parliament system was so powerful, that, you, that an Indian who ha was resilient enough could get justice um, because of the independent judiciary in Britain. Even in 1856, the British parliament was free, the British judiciary was free to even bring the representatives of empire under the scanner. And you know that that really is the power of British democracy, which um, which is something which is quite fantastic, actually. Yes, it is extraordinary. I think even uh, there was a certain Australian uh, lawyer called John Law who was employed by the Rani of Jhansi because he had uh, obtained a certain notoriety by winning court cases against the the British. So. A positive note to end this uh, talk on. I think we've run out of time. Thank you very much to everyone for being here with us. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, and that. Thank you so much. Uh, we wish to thank Moen Mir, Stuart Gordon, Suril Amrit, Ira Mukoti, and we would like to uh, thank our sponsors also, Avid Learning. The authors will be signing their books in author signing area next to Darbar Hall. Thank you so much and have a nice evening. Thank you.